God our Father, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people and for getting us into the body of Christ. We thank you for choosing to add to our number brothers and sisters in faith. Together may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord to whom we give honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Can I invite uh, the elders okay, to represent the church to give them the hand of welcome and also the a reading book to present to them. Shalom. The Sami say, Blessed is the man who his delight is in the word of God. And on his word, he meditate day and night. He will be like a tree planted by the stream of water. And whatever he does prosper because he will bear the fruits in his season and his leaf does not wither. So I'm very excited to be able to meditate with you on the Word of God for tonight's uh, passage that Brother Su Chong had just read very nicely for us. What we're going to talk about tonight is something that sometimes like a taboo because we're going to talk about death, dying, death. To some people, no, this is not something that they want to hear or even want to talk about because they say, oh, death, that's me, that's you. But death is a reality of life, isn't it? Doesn't matter about how rich, how poor you are, doesn't matter how healthy and how weak you are, done, the day will come. All of us will have to face death. And Bible being the instruction for us to know how to live well and definitely talk about it. And very often, we only hear a message of death during the funeral. But today is going to be special. We're going to talk about death during the sermon because Genesis 23 is about death, about a final resting place. Where should be the final resting place? You know, in, uh, in Johor Bahru, the government has given a piece of land for the Christian uh, in Johor Bahru uh, as a Christian cemetery and because it's uh, uh, given by the government it was actually uh, uh, in a way allocated very cheaply just for a service for anyone who need to bury their death and in this place because of that and you know it's uh, very common people were, uh, were, were, were and add on to make the, the, the burial pot nicer by adding a, a marble or adding towel, all kind of shape you can see. It's a real picture of a Hong Kong Christian burial place in Johor Bahru. So the committee, there's a committee overseeing under the uh, Council of Churches in Johor Bahru decided that why not we make it more standard, more systematic? It looks nice. Everybody have the same, and everybody have the same plate in front, uh, and then name, give the name, and maybe chosen a uh, Bible verses. So it was uh, really a good idea. It was accepted, and instead of uh, everybody build their own and all very untidy looking, it's going to be looked like this in time to come. And they also realize that now many people uh, actually. Instead of bury, they cremate. So they started to build the Colombian niche. And at the very first launch after they decided this, alright, and all they organized, and two years ago, 
they have finalized and this is the price okay this is a price <laughs> that is going to be uh, paid for if anyone want to bury they are dead in this uh, Jaw Baru Christian Cemetery. You can see that the burial plot for one person, 6,000. Everything included. Nice, isn't it? Isn't it? And so, very first launch itself, I was told uh, two years ago, 150 of the 150 uh, location, all sold out. <laughs> People book in at once, you know. <laughs> Booking their place of resting place, final resting place. And this was launched uh, just two weeks ago, and I was told that our 94 location, about coming to half, uh, is being taken. Looking at it, we all Christian really uh, think carefully and didn't really spend a lot of money, but because the committee also give a comparison, look at how much other places are selling their plot. No joke. It's really costly even to die. But no one can compare to this place, the most expensive uh, grave in the world. Where is it? This place, Taj Mahal, isn't it? It was built by the emperor, um, emperor, okay, hang on, Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan in the 17th century for his beloved wife called uh, Mantes the Maha, Mantes Maha, and the ivory uh, marble building, majestic, beautiful. They say if you go to uh, India and visit this location, it's recognized as the seven wonder uh, of the world, yeah, and the world, in the world uh, heritage, and the last uh, valuation in two zero two three. You were saying that it was 498 million US dollar. Oh. You convert to ring it for a resting place, a final resting place. It was 2.3 billion ring it for a person, a final resting place. Is that what we look for in the final resting place? What exactly is that Christian belief and Bible teaching about that final resting place? Today we are looking at Genesis 20, 23, where the Bible first indicated there is a need of buying a burial pot. Okay, I'm not going to read to you the, the passage since uh, Sir John has read it very nicely for us. Okay, if you like, you can go back and read this Genesis 23 again. Um, it was said that Sarah died at 127 years old. Wow, really a good old age, isn't it? We knew that before the flood, people lived for a long time. But after the flood, God did indicate that the man lies spent should be 120. So she had left, she had lived beyond uh, 120 up to seven. And are you also aware that Sarah was the only woman in the Bible where the age of her death is clearly mentioned? Not if the first woman of humanity, not Esther, the Jewish girl who became the queen of Persian, not Ruth, the Moabite girl who had the line, who, who, who linked to the line of Jesus Christ. They are all not mentioned. Not Mary, the virgin that will give birth to Messiah. They are age of death, all not mentioned. They show the significance of Sarah. And Sarah there marked a new era, new era in this book of Genesis. Because what is the book of Genesis? Book of Genesis talking about a man that fall far away from God. And God had come out with a plan to redeem man back. And there's going to be a promised son. And this come, come from the woman. You're going to crush the head of the serpent. So 
Sarah was really that man, a woman of that significant of a woman of God. She's so significant that God rescued her twice when she, her life was in danger. And she was, so, she was so significant that the promised son that God promised to Abraham had to come from her. Not hang up. Even though Abraham tried, uh, Abraham and Sarah tried their best to help God because Sarah was barren. But she's so significant. She was so significant. God had chosen her. She must be the woman who's going to bear the prom promise. Son, I think the significance of Sarah, you can really look at other Bible references to really get to understand why Sarah is so significant. Firstly, I, she has that, uh, she has that exceptional faith. The Bible says that by faith, Sarah considered who? God faithful, even though her body is as good as that. And yet she believed. And so she was a woman of exceptional faith. Then she's a woman of remarkable submission. Because when Peter commented on Sarah, he said that like Sarah who obeyed Abraham. We all know that how did how 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 did Sarah obey Abraham, isn't it? Because Abraham tried to save his own life, in fact, put Sarah into danger and asked her to say that, why don't you say that you are my sister, not my wife? And Sarah obeyed, even though it wasn't right. And because of her submission, and of course, we know that her remarkable submission is because she submitted to God. She believed, even though she may be in danger, God would deliver her, which happened. So Peter commented and said that you, others, brother, a sister, if you were to do the same, you are like the daughter of Sarah. You are as good as her. Finally, amazingly, we know that he's a woman of that amazing covenant because the bible say that sarah represent the new covenant we are taught that oh only after jesus come then there is a new covenant no 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 sarah represent the new covenant because sarah those who have the same faith as sarah is not under the law but under grace because sarah is the woman of freedom or the free woman. The son that born then will be sons of the free woman. So you can see, Sarah set the example, the exceptional faith, the remarkable submission, the believing in the amazing covenant for us to believe, for us to imitate, for us to grow into the same as her. See, her name was changed from Sarai, which means in Hebrew, princess, to Sarah by God, to be the mother of all nations. You and I, in a way, she is our matre, and she is the mother of the promise to us. So no doubt, no doubt that when she died, Abraham fell a great loss. A great loss. I put the word there, her, di her death is an unexpected one. Because two references in the Bible indicate to us that her death is unexpected. Because firstly, he said that Abraham went to mourn and to weep for Sarah. The idea when to mourn and weep for indicate that Abraham wasn't with her when she died. So Abraham came to mourn for her and went up to mourn for her, come from somewhere. And the second references, of course, is the, her son. Her son 
Isaac equally mourning and grieving for her because the Bible said that she was only comforted about his mother's death after Isaac married Rebecca. That, is, that was three years later. So it's so painful because the death should be sudden. Because if it's not sudden, Sarah being such a great woman, right? And in the in a wealthy and good family, everybody will be waiting and uh, standing at the side of the bed. See, last moment, last moment. Isn't it? We all know. This is a very common common scenario we see, right? Wow, this is the matriarch, the patriarch of the family. He is breathing his or her last. We know that all the people will gather and okay, you know, right? And then we maybe hold, still waiting and waiting. And then finally the person passed away. But because it's sudden, it's a I don't know how what exactly the Bible didn't say that whether what's the reason that she died, okay? But because it's sudden and tragic, okay, and we know maybe accident, maybe uh, cardiac arrest or major major heart failure, those are brought about the sudden death of people. When we have loved one dying this way, it's painful, isn't it? It's painful. Therefore, sometimes I observe, interestingly, for the sake of the dependent, for the sake of the dependent, and maybe God in His infinite wisdom allow that those who are about to pass away go through some period of a chronic disease or illnesses or prolonged death, a prolonged uh, treatment, prolonged treatment or extended care required for this person until the dependent also feels that wow the way that this person who was suffering and going through was so difficult that maybe going off is good and better isn't it sometimes God in his wisdom allow that compared to a sudden death and he allow that because of the person who passed away nothing huh? But to the person who remain is the one who pain. And God allowed that and that thing to happen. So it linger on until the dependent felt that oh, actually it may be good for him to go. You know, when I first became a Christian, I would call upon to pray for people who are in this situation and they are already very, very sick. And what happened is that uh, almost everyone that went to pray for them died. You know how embarrassed it is for a pastor to go and pray for people he died. There was one, there was one, one family. I just stepped out of the house eh, and, and about to write off the family called me, Pastor, thank you. Because he got home. <laughs> I, felt, I felt, you know, so embarrassed and so difficult. And my wife said that, Ayo, another one like this, you better don't go and pray for them. <laughs> go and pray for them, die. You know. You know, God have his death, infinite wisdom. I think as Christians, we must have the right understanding of death. If we don't have the right understanding of death, then death hit our loved one, and we will be devastated. So let's look at the right understanding of death. That's what Bible is saying. The Bible says that death has been swallowed up in victory. Amazing. We are victorious over death. Death is nothing. Death is really nothing to Christian because death has been swallowed up in victory. And the one that conquered death is our Lord Jesus Christ. And the perishable must be transformed into the perishable. The mortal must become immortality. The Bible says the present body that we have. No matter how we want to keep it well, keep it young. Ah, yo, oh, yeah, wrinkle, yeah, white hair, yeah. Cannot, <laughs> cannot keep long. No matter how long you try, cannot keep very, very long. Uh. We're going to accept that. Ah, yo, 
So they were my leg more pain in you. My old leg. They say old leg, the, the part, uh, the part, no, no more replacement. So he had to be transformed into the imperishable. Then death. The Bible says that it's not the end of relationship. Definitely not the end. Because it's not like people were gone, now no more. You know? Even we see them into the future, mm, falling around like a spirit and so No, 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 no. Death is not like that. The Bible says that the Christian understanding of death is solely, is, 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 is uh, tangible, not intangible. And we will still be in relationship with it. Huh? So to your wife or your husband, well, imagine in heaven you're going to see them again. No? <laughs> that is the relationship that we are going to go on. And Paul advised that for Christian, we don't need to grieve and sit without hope because Jesus has raised to life and we too we are able to raise with the Lord forever. Amazing. Amazing. We all would. Because Jesus has set the example. Jesus has that new body, imperishable. And we also are going to receive the new body, imperishable, immortal. Wow. I'm looking for the day. I told you my earlier uh, 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 childhood ambition is that I hope that I'm going to be a fighter jet pilot. But God knows better. Lah. He said that I better be an uh, engineer or pastor. So I'm not a fighter jet pilot. But the new body can fly. <laughs> you know that? The new body can fly. Oh, I'm looking forward to the day. So as a result of what Jesus has do, we also will be raised to life. Eternal hope in heaven. So we need to live by faith. Not by sight. Not by what we see. We need by faith. Faith in the word of God. And we have that right understanding. I think it will surely comfort us. Not that we cannot grieve. The Bible has never stopped us from grieving even as a, as a Christian. He said that our Lord himself is a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. In fact, when he was at home at, on, on earth with us, his good friend, his good friends, Mary, mother, and the brother Lazarus died. Remember that? He went to their funeral and he saw all of them weeping. And the Bible says that Jesus wept. He was full of compassion. He wept along with us. So it's okay, but it's okay to grieve, but we should not grieve without hope because we know exactly what is death meant to us as Christians, meant to us as believers. In fact, death has nothing to be afraid of. I want to say that. Death really has nothing to be afraid of. What could be even worse than death, I don't know whether you think about it, is missing. Your loved one went missing. Just somehow lost. In the air, disappear. And there's no closure. You don't know what happened. And that can be tormenting. Listen, I share with you, right? I only separated from my son for a, a, a few minutes. But that few minutes, it felt like eternity to me. Oh, thank God. Thank God that he's well and good. Uh, my son. Uh, Joseph, he's uh, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, okay, 20, now. <laughs> Check with my wife, <laughs> 28, 28 years old, now, see, so my personal conviction, if you ask me about death, I firmly believe the word of God say that our day is ordained by the Lord. Our life are clearly written into the book of life where we are conceived, born, and died, decided by God. God knows. And because God decided, I share with you this conviction. 
it will be good because God is good all the time. And because God decided, God know the lifespan of our time individually and each of us have that lifespan that predetermined by God, whatever lifespan is good. Which also means then, however I'm going to die, is good. Whether I die of accident, cancer, or drastic death, good, fantastic, good. Yeah, my wife will say that, don't say that. Uh, I will be very sad. It's true. We had to come back then to the right understanding of death. Death is just a passageway. Death is what God will bring us into the future with him. So because it was sudden right, for Abraham, we knew that it was sudden and Abraham didn't really uh, 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 book a burial place. Uh, we heard the, the Joe Baru, they already book, book, book the burial plot already for chip chip king king to, you know? Yeah, no didn't. So but Abraham identified already what is the place that he want to bury, you know, and go to do it fast because in the culture of Abraham, the way it come from, from the Babylonian, it wasn't mummified. It wasn't mummified. There are some spy and bum, but it wasn't mummified. So he had to do it quite fast. Huh? Otherwise, yeah, you know, the body is going to rotten. And Abraham being the foreigner and stranger of that place, they really had to buy a plot of land, you know. Now, normally, people want to return to the homeland. Remember, Abraham come from the uh, city of Ur in um, Mesopotamia, but he didn't. You know, just a few generations above us, I don't know where you know, no? I heard quite often those Chinese immigrants to Malaysia, when they died, they said, I want to go back to ancestor. A place to be buried. I don't know whether you are aware of that. It's true. They practice that. You know. We knew that there, there, there is a person that we we, 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 we were told, and this person said that when this person died, he wanted to be buried in United Kingdom. You say, hey, but this person is a Malaysian. Huh? Why to bury in United Kingdom? Maybe some special promise that God had given to this person. So in this case of Abraham, she was determined. She wanted to bury Sarah here. And she wanted to bury in this place called the Cave of Medpera from Ephron, the Hittite. The Hittite was occupying the land. Yeah. For many years, archaeologically, they didn't believe there's a Hittite. But finally, they realized that before the, the Assyrian, after Assyrian came the Persian, there was Hittite. They discovered that the evidence archaeologically somewhere in, uh, I think, 19th and 20th century. Yeah. But Hittite was really occupying this land. Then we heard the man. Most of the part uh, verses in there was a lot of bargaining, isn't it? About please sell. No, I give. Listen to me. Hear me. <laughs> there was a lot of this. Listen to me. Listen to me. Please sell me. No, I give. No, I give. But please sell me. You hear? I think you hear this throughout when Sir John was reading to us. Why, Abraham? Doesn't want to receive. I mean, the person want to give one, right? You see, there are two very possible reasons. Remember, King of Sodom want to give to Abraham. Abraham said, "No, no, no, no! I cannot receive anything from you. I don't want later you say that you made me rich." Another thing is that in the culture, if the I give here, I give here may actually mean that I loan it to you. Bury your dead. No, no problem. Bury, bury. Use my burial pot. Bury your dead. But the land belongs to me. You see? 
or oh, Abraham knew very clearly, he kept on insisting that please sell me. Please sell me. And finally, we are told that yes, it was done. With 400 seconds of silver, uh, silver, yes. I checked. They say that 400 shekels of silver were equal to 1,200 days of wages. You know, if you go back, go on you tonight, uh, today earning with a minimum wages of 1,500 per month, it comes about 80,000. 80,000 for a burial plot. It wasn't too cheap, isn't it? Expensive. They knew Abraham was rich, maybe. I like the Chinese practice in here, and I heard that it's not only in Chinese, in some part of Africa, in, in Japan, it's giving the Pekin. I, you know what I mean, like condolence gift. Yeah, I think it helped a lot for those who are in need and at the last moment of the passing away of their loved one. Oh, that community spirit of coming together, contribute and helping, really, really good. So in Abraham case, no need last, he's so rich. What is 400 shekels? He immediately measured, the Bible said, and gave it to Ephraim the Hittite. With that, you see, the land was deeded. Legally, deeded means more. Like as he going to the lawyer office sign, the title deed had transferred to Abraham. One thing very interesting to note in this chapter is that there are no direct reference of the name of God. As precisely said that God is involved. Yeah, we heard that the Hittite called Abraham, you are a prince of God. Or other version I think translate, you are a mighty prince. But there is no direct indication that God is involved. God is directing. God is commanding. You know, you read the whole book of Genesis carefully, you see actually God direct involvement, direct command. Many in almost all the chapter. So what is it that the author trying to tell us here by not saying that God was involved? Oh, because we knew that our uh, God is sovereign, God is in charge. And this is definitely the end of the sovereign view of God that Abraham bought a piece of land in this place where he was a foreigner and stranger. But what is it that the author trying to tell us? I think the author tells us that uh, even without God, Abraham was determined. Abraham was really believing in God. That God will give me this. I gotta do something to make sure that he belongs to me. Hey, but then he got to give wow. How come he still need to buy? Isn't it? We heard that uh, God said you look at north and south in Genesis 13, east and west, all the land you see, I will give you and your offspring will have forever. Lift up your eyes and look, I'm gonna give it to you. But you see, not yet. No, oh, yes, Stephen, the deacon Stephen in the book of Acts mentioned, no, no, and, and mentioned this account. He said that at that point, no, Abraham, Abraham not even own a foot of land. No, you have food. No, yeah. Why? Because God said that to Abraham and prophesied that your descendant will be suffering in a foreign land for 400 years. And then I will rescue them. I will deliver them. And then I will give them this land that I promised. So what Abraham was doing, he just marked into it a firm belief that what God said, even 400 years later, it will happen. It will happen. So come back to you and me. You see, God said many things in the Bible. Many things, and many of these things is not going to happen in your lifetime, in my lifetime. But do you believe? Do you have the unshakable faith? 
unshakable belief like Abraham. Do you see that the person who said it is not an ordinary person? The person who said it is God the Creator. God has his great. Sometimes we took the promises of some great men uh, better than believing in God. Maybe we hear that, oh, you're the king of this place, promise something. Or oh, promise you something. Oh, great. So wonderful. Or oh, the queen promise you something. Oh, you feel so great, so excited. But then we read that God had promised this, promised that, brother. I think I hope from the way that we understand this passage, how us to reorientate ourselves, readjust our perspective to really believe in God in the full swing. Because what Abraham is doing is not a resting place of the present. He was doing in view of a resting pain to come. Hebrews say that he was looking forward. He was looking forward there's something coming in the future. There's the faith of Abraham. And the coming of the future, of course, is the ultimate tomb, isn't it? The ultimate tomb of Jesus Christ. We hear, we heard it mentioned a few times that Jesus will be raised to life again. Jesus in this resting place, we are told that he didn't even go money to buy it. In this resting place where Jesus' body was buried after he was crucified, belonged to Joseph the Animatia, a rich fallacy who owned a cave as a burial plot and he let Jesus bury them. So by then what happened in this tomb <coughs> define our future. Now some of us thought that they had to spend a lot of money. Now look at this carefully. Then you think about whether we should spend a lot of money to find a so-called earthly resting place. Where then should we spend the money to? I told my wife, maybe if anything happened to me, they should cremate me. And then if the law allowed, we throw my ashes in my garden as a fertilizer. Oh, when Jesus come again, I'm going to rise from my garden. Wow, beautiful, isn't it? We don't need a lot because the ultimate tomb could not keep Jesus Christ. He only borrowed it for a few days because he has risen. The angels say that he's not here anymore. We don't need any tomb. That is the firm promise of God. The firm promise of God for all of us in the Bible. So certain, so sure. Sometimes I share about this during the funeral or wait service. I felt excited myself because it's so certain. Our our understanding as a Bible that is just a passageway. We just cross over from this life right away into eternal life. And when Jesus comes again, we're gonna receive the new body. The soul and spirit which is now in heaven will join with the new body, resurrected, glorious body, a body that could fly and live forever and forever. We need this new body, do you know that? Because the Bible says that the final resting place is a new heaven and new earth. Only with this new body, we can move, we can move between earth and heaven. No mystery, it's only said, mentioned many times in the Bible. With this old body, we can never cross over to the spiritual dimension. But with the new body, yes, we can just cross over. The final resting place is the assurance that God gives to us. 
that we will be with him forever. There's no more tears, no more sorrow. And the greater, I would say that even greater, somehow I feel that even greater, is that we will be with our loved one. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it great? All that will pass on, all that may be after us, were together because of faith in Jesus Christ. So I want to invite you, don't think too long, don't think too far, because there's no clearer teaching than the Word of God, what death is. And there's no clearer teaching than the promise of God. You and I will have eternal life, will enter into heaven, and because Jesus died for us, so don't think. Join. Join all the brother and sister here to believe, to accept. Jesus has done great work for us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord and Father, we thank you once again that your clear teaching in the Bible, how you think that we deserve sending your only son Jesus to die for us. Although all of us have sinned, have fallen short of the glory of yours, and have been astray and gone far away from you, and yet, Lord, you did not count our sin against us. You have provided the, journey, the, the, the provisions of faith that we can believe in you and by grace that we have been saved and through faith that we can come into the promise of yours of eternal salvation and our final resting place is with you, with the loved one forever and ever. Thank you, Lord. We ask your continued blessing be upon us. They continue to help us to follow you faithfully all the days of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are going to have the Holy Communion. Can I invite the server to come up to stand with me? that we can start. give thanks together with a thankful heart for the privilege that we can be together in partaking of this Holy Communion. Our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, have instituted the celebrations of the Lord's Supper and subsequently he had passed on the instruction to Apostle uh, Paul who had written clearly for us in 1 Corinthians 11 and the manner that we should conduct the partaking of this Holy Communion. So let's listen to the instruction and follow in the Spirit. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the lost death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be singing against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself 
before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment unto himself. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for the celebrations of Holy Communion that we can have in Jesus' name. In your holy and glorious presence, we were unfit even to pick up the crumbs under your table. But because of your great love and mercy for us, you called us into your being, covered us in with your people as one holy nation, and seated us in the heaven realms in Christ Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for the institutions of Holy Communion. We praise you for your unconditional love and the sacrifice of yourself on the cross for our transgressions and sin. Now in you we have redemption through your blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of your grace that you had lavished us with all wisdom and understanding. Dear Lord Jesus, we praise you that for us you have sanctified yourself so that we too may be truly sanctified. Thank you for praying for all of us that we may be one. Just as you and the Father are one that we may be in you and the Father in complete unity so that the world may believe that the Father has sent you and that you have sent us. Thank you for giving us the glory that the Father has given you and that you and the Father have loved us so much. May you bless us this time of fellowship and communion we have before this table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite all those who baptize and confirm to join us in partaking of this sacrament. If you have been breaking bread and taking a cup in your respective church, uh, do join us in doing so. Um, one, two, three, and one go up. Can you can maybe you go up? Yeah. See one, one block. Yeah. It, as it come to you, please stand where you are. Uh, take off a piece and hold it to all who partake, receive it, and we are partake together. The bread that you have is a body of Christ given for us. Receive it with a thankful heart in remembrance of Him. It's a new covenant in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Drink of it and be thankful in remembrance of Him. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Let us pray. And those who can stand, maybe stand up all together with us. Dear Father, we thank you for choosing us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in your sight. In love, you have predestined us to be adopted as your sons and daughters to Jesus Christ our Lord. In accordance with your pleasure and view, to the praise of your glorious grace which you have freely given us, in Christ whom you love. Mm -hmm. And you have promised and purpose in Christ that a day will come that to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Lord Jesus, we are privileged to be accepted before your holy presence. 
and to the partaking of this sacrament together. We are united with you as one body. So we thank you for calling us, saving us, and making us into the body of yours, which is your church. Now, as your body, your church, may you direct our path and guard our ways. May you strengthen us and empower us to move forward to achieve the purpose of the plan you have for us. Help us to be bold and courageous in your, as your witnesses in this last day. Transform us and mold us to be Christ-like. Equip us and empower by the Holy Spirit to share the good news to the lost. Thank you. And we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, we will collect for you those disposable cup. Okay, uh, let's uh, rise for the final song, closing song.
receive the benediction. May God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you true and true. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and He will do it.